Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Star Course Series, where those of you joining in today's class already know how important it is for humans to foster their curiosity, explore, and learn. But did you know animals need enrichment to live a happy and healthy life, too? Today, we're joined by virtual programs instructor Susan McLaughlin of the South Carolina Aquarium, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about how the team at the aquarium makes sure that their animal residents live a happy and healthy life through engaging animal enrichment. Now, before I hand it off to Susan to get us started, there are just a few things that I wanna make sure we keep in mind to make the most of today's live lesson. First off, we'll have the opportunity to both ask and answer some questions throughout the lesson. So by all means, feel free to put those questions and answers in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. If we don't get to those questions right away, not to worry, we'll have a couple of times throughout the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A. You'll also wanna be sure that you have your cameras close by because at a couple of points throughout the lesson, we're also going to get to meet some very special guests today. And we encourage you to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie with those special guests. And if you post that selfie on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as the South Carolina Aquarium, you will be entered to win a one week membership to the virtual summer camp of your choice. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things along to your instructor for today, Susan. Susan, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to Varsity Tutors for inviting us to share this exciting topic with you guys. Um, and maybe you've never heard of enrichment before, but I'm really excited to tell you all about it. Um, it sounds like a big fancy word, but it's a concept that you probably already kind of know a lot about. Just like Haley said, you know that you want to do different things throughout your day um, and enrich your mind and challenge yourself, even just doing this today, right? Joining one of these star courses is something different um, that you don't get to do every single day. Um, and it's a great way to kind of challenge your brain, maybe learn something new, do something exciting and fun. Um, and that's what we want to do for all of our animals here at South Carolina Aquarium. Now, when you think of an aquarium, you might think of fish, and we do have a lot of fish here, um, but we have other animals as well. And today we're going to meet some reptiles. Um, and reptiles need enrichment just as much as any other animal. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit about kind of why we do it, um, what it is, um, and then we're going to get a really close look um, at some of those examples. So I'm excited to share them with you guys. So let's just kind of start off with um, a little bit of a lesson on a whiteboard. I just want to make sure that you guys know kind of what enrichment is and why we're even talking about it. And, you know, school's going to start up again, so we're going to learn on whiteboards. Um, but I promise I'm only going to use the whiteboard for a minute, and then you're going to get a really close look at these reptiles, too. So um, just to start off, I want to talk about um, enrichment in a couple of different ways. So this big word that I'm talking about with you guys today, enrichment. And it's really about enriching your life. That's kind of part of why um, that's on there. So what is enrichment, right? Those are the questions that we always want to ask. What is it? How do we do it? Um, we've got different types of enrichment. And then I want to give you guys examples. These are kind of the questions we're going to answer today. So. There's lots of different animals. And I think a good way to think about this too is when you talk about your animals at home so um, or yourself. So if you have a pet, maybe think about your pet in this way, um, or you can think about kind of what you would do for yourself too. Um, so what is enrichment? Enrichment is when we're going to be trying to um, kind of change up anything in your daily life. So um, you wanna make sure that you're doing something for an animal that's really species appropriate. So, um, you know, there's animals that like to climb, like monkeys, right? Um, but fish don't climb. So if we gave a climbing toy or tool to a fish, they probably wouldn't get to use it, right? So we wanna make sure we're always thinking about what is that animal doing naturally in their environment? Um, and how can we help them do that in our care here at the aquarium? So we wanna make sure that it's all of those things, you know, kind of natural, species appropriate. Um, and the reasons that we want to do it um, are to give that animal a really healthy life. We want them to make sure that um, they are challenged, their brain is working, their bodies are working, sometimes it's exercise, um, and it helps give them control. So an animal, even humans, um, we like to be in control of ourselves, right? We want to be able to make choices for ourselves. So enrichment's a great way for us to give that choice to that animal. Um, and we don't want to just 
hand something to an animal and say, you're enriched now. We gave you this toy. And if they don't interact with it, then that wasn't enrichment. That was just us putting something with them. Um, so how do we do it? We're going to think about, um, you know, we come up with a plan first. We're going to come up with an idea and say, I think that, you know, let's think about if you have a dog at home. You know, I, I think I want to enrich my dog. Now, how do I do that? Let's think about what things a dog might like or do in, um, you know, what are some of their natural behaviors? Um, and what comes to mind quickly for me is that dogs love to smell, right? They've got a really good sense of smell. So maybe we could do something for a dog, for your pet dog, um, that helps them use that sense of smell. So you come up with that brainstorming part of the idea of that process, right? Um, and then maybe you go ahead and create something. So um, you could, um, and if you want to do this at home, you definitely um, can try it out. And it's a lot of fun, but you have to make sure um, you talk to your parents first. Always get parents permission before um, trying out something new with your animals. But um, one thing I like to do is take like a paper towel roll and put a couple pieces of food inside of it and kind of twist up the ends and then give that to my dog or toss it on the ground and have him try to investigate you know he can smell that there's food in there and he's like how do I get to that food so he makes use his brain right and he might have to tear it open or shake it around and figure out how to get the food out of it right so once that happens we're going to be observing um, which makes it enriching for us too because we're kind of checking out what's going on we're going to be observing what's going on um, and then we are going to be able to uh, kind of regroup on that kind of think about how it went and if you would do anything differently next time, maybe you did it and your dog didn't interact with it at all. And you're like, well, maybe food inside of it wasn't motivating, but maybe if we put a treat inside of it. So it's always kind of retrying new things and thinking about what's going to work best for the animals in your care. Um, so that could be a pet at home, but that we also do with all of our animals here at the aquarium. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple of different types um, after we meet some of the animals um, and we get to see some of those examples. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the different types of enrichment too. Um, but one really cool example to give you kind of a wide range, you know, we're thinking about dogs, but you know, an animal we do a lot of enrichment for at the aquarium is an octopus. This is not a real octopus. This is a stuffed one, but we do have octopus here at the aquarium and they're really intelligent animals. So we want to make sure we're really challenging their brains. So sometimes we'll put their food um, in something like a jar and we'll close the lid. Now octopus are actually smart enough to unscrew the lid off of a jar and get their food out. We've got like a little pretend fish in there. But we really do that. We do all kinds of different enrichment for um, for all of our animals, and especially like the octopus. It's really cool to watch him figure out how to um, open up a jar. So they're very smart animals. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and meet our first animal friend so that I can tell you a little bit about different types of enrichment. Um, so if you do have a phone or a camera ready to be able to take pictures, um, I definitely want you guys to get a chance to look at this little guy. Um, he's actually kind of a younger animal that we have here at the aquarium. Um, so he's kind of on the smaller side. Don't be afraid. Some people are a little bit scared of this kind of animal. Um, this is a little corn snake. Now his name is Fritter. That's a little play on uh, play on words. He's a corn snake. Um, they are named uh, corn snakes because of the pattern on their bodies. And you can kind of see it on that underside of him. He's got this beautiful checkered pattern. It's one of the prettiest types of snakes, in my opinion. Um, and they are known for um, eating lots of different things that might live in um, in like a a corn field, but they don't eat corn. So if you thought they were named corn snakes for the food that they ate, um, that's incorrect. They don't eat corn. Um, they actually are going to eat lots of small rodents. Um, they might even eat eggs um, or birds if they can catch them. So they're very smart animals and they're really good climbers. So for enrichment for a snake um, like Fritter here, the corn snake, um, you know, if I'm thinking about what might be enriching to Fritter, you know, if he likes to climb, um, maybe we try and give him a tree to climb in. Um, so, oh my gosh, he's like looking at the computer screen. Oh, that's a really close look. <laughs> I wish he was a little bit more in focus, but that's really funny. So close and tiny. Um, I, we've actually created this pegboard um, of different sticks that he can climb on. So we'll let you guys um, get a really close look at him exploring that. Um, and 
I'm going to get him all set up, but I'm sure you guys have questions about this corn snake. So um, if you have any questions in the chat, um, we're going to get some of those right now. Um, and then hopefully we can find out a little bit more about Fritter while we watch him explore on his tree here. Awesome. So as we're getting situated, one of the questions that's come up most frequently so far, uh, perhaps because we have some students at home who maybe, yes, have pets, but specifically have pet reptiles or pet snakes, are there any sort of additional enrichment activities that we can think of that may be safe for them to try at home, of course, with a parent's permission, uh, that are accessible for them to situate for a pet snake specifically? Oh, great. Great question. Okay, so you could create something like this, although um, really a lot of types of snakes that you might have as a pet are not necessarily the climbing species. So um, if you have, um, I'm trying to think of some other types of snakes, um, if it's not a corn snake or a rat snake, they probably aren't going to climb. So um, in that instance, it wouldn't be species appropriate, right? They wouldn't probably enjoy it all that much. Um, but what you could do is create places for them to hide because snakes love hiding places. Um, and I love to use different recyclable items um, or, or maybe not recyclable, but kind of I like to recycle items by um, creating little hides for animals. So um, with any small reptiles um, or even mammals like um, rats or hamsters, if you have any of those as pets, um, creating little hiding places for them can be really fun. Um, so you could take an old shoe box or a cereal box and cut holes in it. Um, and our snakes love to climb in and out of those. It looks like Fritter has really enjoyed climbing down a little bit lower and I get him resituated, but you can see how well he can use the muscles on his body to kind of climb down um, without just falling. I know if I was his size climbing on here, I wouldn't be able to be as graceful. He's kind of climbing down in the dirt down here too and burying himself in there too. So different types of substrate um, or the materials that you can see here um, are another great example of enrichment. <laughs> He's so hidden back in here. Nice and dark. Probably a little bit calming. So giving him a space like that. Can we see him on this side still? I don't think so. Um, giving him a space where he can hide um, is also enrichment for sure. Um, just like that example. Um, if you have any other types of reptiles, um, places they can hide or creating kind of temperature differences within their tanks or enclosures, um, you know, where they have a warm side or a cool side or um, different water options um that's a great a great thing that you could do too awesome and if we're ready for another question another really great one that came up is helping to understand how we can tell when our animals may be in need of some enrichment so of course it sounds like we want to be incorporating these sorts of things on a regular basis but are there any sorts of cues that can let us know that maybe our animals feeling a little bit bored and we should think about an enrichment activity Great example, yeah, um, or great question, uh, especially with um, like mammals and stuff, but it would, it, you could find out with your, um, right, let's start with reptiles. You guys said you had maybe some pet reptiles. Um, if they are what I would call lethargic, so if they're not really doing much, um, if they're laying around and, and not really exploring very often, then that might be a sign that they need some change. Um, they need some enrichment. Um, if you have an animal like a dog um, or a cat that is maybe being um, what might seem like they're being a little bit naughty, maybe getting into things that they're not supposed to um, or chewing up, you know, the couch furniture or something like that. That's a really good sign that maybe they need somewhere to direct that energy, right? Maybe they're chewing on the couch because, you know, chewing is a natural behavior and they need something else to chew on. So um, what might seem like bad behavior might actually just be um, kind of a good sign that you need to do a little bit more for that animal, give them a little bit um, of extra attention and um, a different activity. It's a little bit hard to see up in this corner here. So you can come around the other side. Oh, there we go. Do we have any other questions? Maybe just one more specific to our friend Fritter here and other snake species. Uh, so we ha had some specific questions. I know you gave the example with perhaps pet uh, dogs or pet cats around how we can incorporate food into their enrichment activities. Are there any ways or cases where we incorporate food into the enrichment activities of our reptiles? Good question. So um, with snakes, um, they're not going to eat very often. 
Um, and a lot of them are going to eat small mammals. So things like um, maybe like little mice and stuff like that. Um, so often with our snakes, um, when people have snakes as pets, they're really trying to offer them food um, and just kind of document when they are eating. So since they don't eat very often, I wouldn't probably try to hide the food from the snake because that might be a little bit trickier to um, to be able to check to see if they have eaten it or they might kind of just lose interest in it since they're not super motivated since they don't need to eat very often. Um, if you have an animal like maybe a lizard or um, an amphibian like a frog or something that might eat other small insects, that's a great um, a great way to try to enrich them. So you could give them an animal uh, or a food that might move around more like a live cricket um, something like that. You can hide their mealworms um, or other types of worms and things like that into different things. Excuse me. Ooh, I was going to sneeze. <laughs> um, but they are, um, it kind of depends on what they eat. Or if you have a turtle, um, a lot of turtles will eat um, different fruits and vegetables. You can definitely hide those kinds of things. You guys had great questions. So you're already starting to think about different types of enrichment, right? Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about those. So um, obviously we talked about food. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can enrich with food. Um, there's also sensory enrichment. So that's um, different types of things that they can feel on their body. So um, this could also be uh, maybe touch. So things they can feel like this mulch underneath um, the uh, snake's body right now. Um, that's good sensory enrichment. Um, anything they can smell or taste um, or maybe even sounds or things they can see. So um, sometimes with our birds, like our bald eagle here at the aquarium, I'm gonna have to get him because he's escaping. <laughs> um, with our bald eagle, um, we are able to uh, give her different sounds like, um, Let's get him over here. There we go. Um, <laughs> like different bird noises. So we use all kinds of different noises um, and sounds to be able to enrich her. There we go. Now we can see Fritter really well, that beautiful orange color. Um, so that's another type of sensory enrichment. Um, and then there's also going to be a lot of other types of enrichment like cognitive. Um, so those are things that are kind of a mental sim stimulation or giving them a choice. Um, they can be physical things. So um, maybe like this uh, substrate or um, or these pegboards, you know, kind of giving them sort of some exercise and physical enrichment. And then there's social enrichment as well. So um, allowing them to interact with other species or maybe other members of the same species, um, that can be good social enrichment. There's a really great video on our Facebook page um, of one of our snakes named Spruce, um, who is playing in front of our otter exhibit. And he's looking at the otters and the otters are looking at him. Um, and it's pretty funny to see. They're like obviously both or all very interested in each other because they don't see each other that often. So that's good social enrichment as well. All right, does anybody have any last questions about Fritter the corn snake? I'm gonna go ahead and get him put away because we've got another friend to meet too. So as we're getting that taken care of, one other big question about Fritter specifically is we had some specifics around, do we know how old Fritter is? Do we have any more details there? And how he came to be under your care? Great question. So Fritter actually came from another facility. Um, and so he was born at another, actually at a zoo. Um, I'm going to turn my screen around so I can get him. Um, but he was born at a zoo. So we do know how old he is. He's actually only a little over a year old. So he's still pretty young. Um, and he's kind of new to being able to work with us here um, at the aquarium. So um, when he first comes from another facility, we want to make sure that he um, has time to be able to adjust. Um, and we're going to make sure that he is also on quarantine. So everyone learned what that word meant um, a lot more in the last year. But um, we use that a lot in, uh, in cases with our animals. We want to make sure that they um, don't interact with other animals of the same type um, or any other animals until they pass their quarantine period. So that's making sure that they don't have any diseases that could be passed to another species um, and kind of getting them all settled before we start using them. Let's see. You guys can get one last chance for a little selfie with Fritter. Very interested in the computer screen. <laughs> all right, I'm going to get him put away because we have another animal to meet. Um, and this is where the art 
part comes in. So um, we talked about this program being animal art and enrichment. Um, so this animal is going to create some artwork for us. Um, and this animal probably doesn't know it's creating any artwork. Um, it's just how it's I'm going to be enriched today. So um, I'll explain a little bit more about that. But this little guy is really aptly named for um, a program about animal art. This is Picasso, the painted turtle. <laughs> so um, he's a painted turtle that is going to be painting today. Um, <laughs> and that sounds kind of silly, but um, the type of turtle is called a painted turtle. He has this beautiful markings, these um, red and yellow um, kind of all over him. This is a species you could find in South Carolina. Um, and uh, he is definitely showing off that he is an aquatic turtle. So that means he doesn't spend as much time on land. He likes to be in the water and swimming. Um, he's got these great webbed feet. Here, let me see. This might be another good. If I move out of the frame, I'd be able to get him a little bit more in focus if you guys want to get a good picture with him, with Picasso, um, and we'll have another opportunity to while you guys watch him paint. So um, Picasso has been um, in our care for a pretty long time. This is actually about full grown for a painted turtle. Um, he is just kind of a small guy, um, but he is really a great ambassador for his species. Um, even though we can find this species of turtle um, around here, we often don't see them. So there aren't, um, there aren't as many as there should be. Um, I'm they're, I don't think they're on the endangered species list, but they, I think they're maybe threatened. So um, that means there's still not as many as there should be. And they're often really negatively impacted um, by humans. So um, one of the things that's really causing a big problem for these turtles is um, habitat loss. That means that the place that they live um, is kind of being threatened. Often people are building in that area, um, you know, filling in lakes and streams and ponds and redirecting water to make room for new neighborhoods and buildings and stuff like that. So um, we often don't get to see them as much as we would like um, and their numbers are decreasing. So um, we wanna make sure that we're really taking care of the habitat of all of these animals. Do you see his little eyes go in? So cool when he does that. He can kind of squint his eyes all the way back and flip this um, clear eyelid so he can see underwater. Pretty neat. But yeah, we wanna make sure we're always taking care of these animals um, by protecting their habitats and especially by keeping it clean. So it's a great reminder that um, we're sharing this earth with so many amazing animal species um, and we can help them a lot just by keeping things clean. So if you see trash, make sure you pick it up and dispose of it properly um, and then try to create less trash in the first place. You know, we wanna make sure that we are um, reusing things when we can, maybe creating habitats for our pets at home um, or uh, recycling when we can um, and just trying to use less plastic overall since that's what's causing the most um, impact um, on these animals out in the wild. Now he looks like he's ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and set him down over here where you guys will get a chance to see him up close as he creates his art. I've got his, um, his whole <laughs> oh my gosh, he took off running. He's got his whole artwork set up here. Let me turn us around. Oops, look at the ceiling. There we go. Whoa, <laughs> he's moved so fast. There we go. So I set up some paint for him um, and he's got all these canvases. Now we talked about him painting, right? Picasso does not know that he's painting. Um, he probably can feel sensory though, all of the paint um, underneath his little feet. So it's gonna feel a lot like mud. Um, and that is something he would encounter a lot in the wild. Oh my goodness, he's moving so fast. I'm gonna make sure he doesn't climb out of here. <laughs> now we love to create this artwork um, because people like to take these home. Um, we do have them in our gift shop here. Um, but this is another fun thing that you could do with um, your reptiles at home. Turn them around so that he doesn't climb out. Um, but you could do this with a reptile at home, like a turtle or a snake. You obviously wanna make sure you're using non-toxic paint. Um, and definitely you want a parent's help and approval with this. Um, some animals might not like it. Um, and Picasso is, does it all the time. I think he's just trying to explore right now. Um, I wouldn't say that he doesn't like it, but you wanna make sure your animal's not eating or ingesting that paint, right? Um, that wouldn't be good. And you wanna make sure that they feel safe um, and also that you know, you're comfortable handling your animal enough to pick them up and move them if you need to. 
Now, do you guys have questions about Picasso while I chase him around his artwork here? <laughs> So we had a couple of very specific questions, but one of them uh, relates to how Picasso maneuvers underwater. So is he able to see underwater? Does he close his eyes when he's underwater? How is he able to be on land and in water? Great question. So he does breathe water um, as a turtle, and they all are going to breathe water. I'm sorry, breathe hair outside of water. Um, he cannot breathe in the water. Um, so he's going to come out of the water to breathe, come to the surface. Um, but he's going to hold his breath for a really long time when he dives down underwater. And he can see while he's underwater too. So he has this clear eyelid um, that goes across his eye. It's called a nictitating membrane. Um, that clear eyelid does allow him to see while he's underwater like a little pair of goggles, um, which is really important because um, he's going to be finding a lot of his food underwater. He loves to eat fish. Um, he's also going to eat little aquatic worms. Um, and he's going to be able to climb out of a pond um, and sun himself if he wants. You can see how well he can climb right here, right? So he's trying to climb right out of here. He could climb right out of a pond and up onto a nice sunny rock. You guys might have even seen um, in your neighborhood um, some turtles that are sunning themselves. Let me see if I can maybe create another layer for him here so he can't come out all the way. Oh my goodness, he's so tall. <laughs> he's the strongest little turtle. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions about Picasso? So you started to answer the other major question that we got, and that was around Picasso's favorite foods. So perhaps specifically at the aquarium, are there, are there some favorite foods that Picasso and some of his friends might particularly enjoy? Great question. Yes. Yeah, so we want to give him a wide variety of food. Remember, we want to always be changing things up for these animals, right? That's enrichment. So lots of different types of things. Um, but his favorite is what's called lake smelt, um, which is a small type of fish. Um, we're often going to cut it up into really little pieces too, because it's probably bigger than what he would be eating in the wild. So we cut it into little pieces. Um, we like to toss that in the water for him. Um, and then he has to kind of go fish it out. All right, awesome. And perhaps just one more question uh, of our friend Picasso here, and that is we're looking to see how we can tell what sorts of enrichment activities particular species enjoy and whether all animals of the same species have the same preference for enrichment. Great questions. Um, you guys are really thinking about these animals kind of specifically, right? And that's very important. So um, they might have things that are really common for the species as a whole. Let's see if you can see them real close as I turn my screen around. Um, there might th be things that like most turtles generally like this one thing, um, but they're individuals too, right? You know, we're all humans, but we like different things than our friends and our brothers and our sisters, right? We don't all like the exact same thing. So it's really important um, to make sure that we are giving um, these animals lots of different options and figuring out what might work really well for them. So um, when you're trying to design an enrichment program for an animal, you wanna make sure that you're thinking about um, what would happen naturally for that animal in the wild um, or kind of what uses their natural abilities. Um, but then you also want to make sure that you're observing. Like I said, you know, we don't want to just take um, take this animal and say, I enriched it. We, we gave it this thing and now it is enriched. <laughs> um, you want to be observing and changing. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a whole scientific process, right? It's kind of like an experiment. You're going to look at what's happening, figure out what works really well, what didn't work so well, um, and try to make some of those changes. I'm going to get a little towel over here, but this might be your best opportunity um, to get a really good picture of Picasso, a good, um, a good selfie with him, because he looks like he's been painting. He obviously has been. He's got kind of covered in paint. So it does feel like mud um, to Picasso. So um, that's good enrichment. If he had been in um, the wild, he probably would uh, <laughs> have been walking through all kinds of different textures. Um, and the paint kind of models that for him. Now, normally I would let him walk longer, but um, he was kind of giving me those signals that he was done in there, right? He's trying to climb out. Um, and I don't think it was necessarily that he didn't want to paint, um, not that he didn't like painting, um, but probably just that he um, didn't really want to be in there anymore. He was moving. He had places he'd rather go. So he looks a lot more satisfied just kind of being held up here where he can look at stuff. So, um, you know, watching your animal and observing what they need um, is a great way to kind of keep doing enrichment the right way, you know, making sure that we are thinking about those kinds of things and doing what works really well for them.
I don't know if you guys have any other questions about enrichment, um, but I can give you some more examples from some of the other species we have here too when, when we're done with a couple more questions about Picasso. Awesome. So perhaps a little bit more general of a question, but we have lots of students who were either maybe a little concerned, perhaps initially a little frightened, or maybe just concerned to make sure that our animal friends are being safely interacted with as well, who wanted to know how, what sort of steps you take to make sure that you are interacting with animals like Fritter and Picasso in a way that's both safe to you and safe to them? Definitely. So these are wild animals and we want to make sure we are being extra respectful of them, right? And these aren't wild animals that we just took out of the wild today, right? Picasso here and Fritter, they've been at the aquarium for a while and we've been working with them. They've been handling them, getting them used to us and us used to them. So um, I would never go walk up to a wild animal and pick it up. You know, you want to make sure you always leave wild animals where they are, observe them from a nice respectful distance. Um, you know, I like to suggest get a good pair of binoculars or any pair of binoculars. Um, it's a great way to look at wildlife and um, kind of give them that safe space that they really need. Um, and then you kind of get to see them do more of their natural behaviors too, because um, you're going to be leaving them in their natural environment. So you always want to give them a lot of space. Um, and not pick them up, but also don't feed wild animals. Um, that's something that I think people think that they're doing something really nice, feeding an animal out in the wild, and we all love our animals, so we want to take care of them, but um, that can really cause a lot of harm for them, especially animals like um, birds or turtles in ponds. Um, if you feed them food, especially human food, um, they get used to that, and then they don't go hunt for their own food. They don't get a good variety. It can cause a lot of issues for them and their health. Um, it could also make them, you know, if they're used to humans bringing them food, it might make them come out of the water and go looking for humans to give them food, which could put them in a dangerous situation, like maybe on the road. Um, or, um, or if it's a dangerous animal that's used to being fed, like here in South Carolina, we talk a lot about alligators. Um, we never want to feed wild alligators because then they might go try to find another human that could bring them food, which would be really scary if an alligator was like, hey, do you have any food for me? And was coming up towards you. You don't want that to happen. So we never want to feed wild animals or touch wild animals. Just observe them from a safe distance. Um, but if you have an animal at home um, that you are working with, you know, that's your pet, um, I would just kind of work on it slowly, you know, pay attention to kind of their their cues if they look uncomfortable put them down um you know Picasso there was looking like he was tired of being in there so I picked him up for a little while when he got squirmy in my hand here I put him down in his bin so he could relax so um I never want to be kind of forcing an animal to do something they don't want to do you want to be always paying really close attention to what works well for them Awesome. And then as kind of a follow up, we talked a little bit about how we can safely interact with animals or with perhaps our pets at home. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, you mentioned enrichment where we introduce animals to other animals of the same species or maybe even other species. Could you talk to us about the sorts of things that you do at the aquarium to make sure that that's done safely and how, how can you tell whether those animals get along well? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, let's take those otters for an example, because I talked about that video. Um, we recently got some new baby otters in, um, and we had adult older otters at the time. Now, those are the same species, so you would think otters are going to get along, right? Um, but they don't know each other. They've never met, so we want to make sure we do a really slow introduction. So we've got animal experts, these biologists that are, um, you know, really good at these introductions. They're going to do it really slowly, and they often start by just having them maybe interact in a similar area, but very separate where they can't see each other, but maybe they can hear and smell. So they can hear and smell each other. And they're like, I think there's another otter over there. Um, but they're not interacting directly. That goes well for a little bit. Maybe a couple of days later, they interact where they can see each other, but through like a fence or a window. So they can see each other, smell each other, hear each other, but they can't interact yet, right? And then maybe we, a couple of days after that, open it up so that they can actually interact more closely. Um, and obviously, we won't just leave them alone. We're going to have our biologists there um, watching very closely to make sure that's done safely. So it is a slow process. Um, we're always going to be watching really carefully, um, make sure that everyone is really comfortable. Those introductions went really well, but all the otters were cuddling together um, as soon as they were allowed together. So they did great. Um, but then I talked about the animal or the enrichment that we did where our snakes met our otters, right? 
that was through the glass. <laughs> we, we didn't have them closely together because an otter might eat a snake in the wild. Um, now, our otters here, maybe they were interested in eating him. Maybe that's what they were looking at him for. Um, our snake didn't look very scared. He apparently did not think that otter was going to eat him. He was like, they were looking right at each other. Um, but we had them through this big, it's really acrylic um, window. Um, and so they, there was no chance of any bad interaction. So obviously we wanna make sure we're thinking about all of these things. When you're working with any animal, whether it's your pet um, or you know an animal in the aquarium, we have to consider all of those options and make sure we're being really respectful and taking care of the animals. Awesome. And kind of a follow-up to that, we had some students who were wondering, you know, as people, maybe we like to engage in these enrichment activities with our friends. So maybe we might, you know, watch a movie with friends or play a game with friends. Do animals tend to like to enjoy to, or tend to enjoy going through those enrichment activities together? And do they make friends? Another awesome question that I love to talk about because um, it's another good example of, you know, what's enriching for one animal might not be for another. Um, and we hear that a lot with our sea turtles here. So we have sea turtles in a hospital. Um, and so we have this whole hospital where we're caring for them and they are all by themselves. They're in their own tank by themselves. Um, and sometimes people are really worried and they're like, that turtle looks so lonely. And if I was in the hospital, I would want my friends and my family around. Um, and that's true for humans, right? You want to be around other humans. We're very social animals. Sea turtles are not. They are very solitary animals. So you might see them in the same area during certain times of year if they're feeding um, or maybe laying their eggs on nests up on the beaches. Um, but in the wild, generally, they do not hang out with other turtles. They like to be on their own. They don't form groups. They're not social. Um, so putting them in the same place here would be really stressful. If we put two in the same tank, they probably wouldn't like that at all. They would be very, you know, territorial. They want their own space. They don't want to interact with another animal. So, you know, you have to think about those things, even though that sounds comforting for us to be around another human, it's not the same for a sea turtle. So, um, you know, when we work on any of these enrichment projects, we're not just kind of coming up with these ideas too. We have to do research first. So um, even if you're thinking of doing something with one of your pets at home, you know, if you have a bearded dragon, maybe, um, you know, one of the best things you could do to kind of start that whole process is maybe go to the library and check out some books on bearded dragons and find out kind of, um, you know, what do these animals do um, in the wild or what are sort of their natural behaviors and kind of work from there, you know, thinking about what they would naturally be doing um, and kind of what their natural environment would be before we start to kind of pick other things for them. Awesome. And I know we mentioned a little bit about the bald eagle earlier, and we have some, <laughs> some students at home who are curious about bird specific enrichment. So are there any other favorite examples that you have of enrichment that you interact with at the aquarium or that students could interact with at home with a pet bird? Great question. Um, yes, there are lots of different things of enrichment depending on the type of bird because birds have a really wide range of things that they like to do and habitats they like to live in. Um, so for our bald eagle, one of her favorite enrichments um, is tearing things up. So we love to make almost like paper mache. Um, we'll take like newspaper and hide her food inside of it um, or even give her like bones, like a dog bone, you know, I mean, not a bone from a dog, but a dog, that, a bone that a dog would eat. Um, so it's kind of similar because wild, bald eagles in the wild love to eat um, carry on or food that is maybe already passed away. So an animal that they find out in the wild, they're going to eat kind of like vultures. Um, so they're going to be kind of using that same natural behavior. Our bald eagle here, she loves to tear stuff up just like she would be eating her food out in the wild. Um, but that would be very different from like a shorebird. So um, maybe one of our ibis. Ibis are shorebirds. They've got this really long curved beak um, that they like to use to get down into mud holes to eat crabs. So we love to hide their food down into these deep tubes um, that allow them to use that natural ability. If you have pet birds at home, um, usually pet birds are um, different like parrot and parakeet species. Those are really smart birds and they are a good example of if you have an animal at home that's kind of misbehaving or getting into a lot of stuff, um, it could be because they need more activity because those birds need a ton of attention and tons of enrichment to keep them happy. Um, so 
you definitely can find stuff online, lots of suggestions for enrichment for pet birds because they need a lot of stuff, but they love to tear things up, look for food. Um, it depends on the species again, but um, you could certainly do some research at the library or online to find some good activities for them too. All right, and possibly one of the most popular questions of today's class, uh, is Picasso due for a bath? after he's created this masterpiece. <laughs> How do we clean Picasso from all that? Paint? Great question. Yes, he is. And I think I am too. I've got paint all over me, but um, he is due for a bath. So he will go, he's actually in a little bit of water right now and you kind of see him. So he's kind of rinsing off a little bit. You can see how green it got from all of his paint. And I'm going to switch out his water in a little bit. Um, it is non-toxic paint. So um, he's totally fine to be, um, have a little bit of it on him, but um, some of our turtles actually really like um, kind of this bath. So a little bit of running water on them, almost like if they were in a stream or a pool like that, um, which they could find in the water um, or in the wild. Uh, some of them really respond well to that. Picasso is one of them. He kind of stretches out his legs and his neck um, and looks really comfortable. Um, that's a good signal to me that he's enjoying something. So to kind of knowing what an animal looks like when they feel comfortable versus feel scared. You know, if a turtle's scared, they're gonna tuck their hands and feet and head in really tight. But if he's relaxed, he's gonna kind of stick all those limbs out so when you put him under running water he looks really comfortable so that's a good signal to me that he likes it so he'll get a little bath after this <laughs> all right and we have lots and lots of students who uh think it's pretty cool that you get to interact with these animals on a regular basis and are wondering what sorts of things you studied or others at the aquarium might have studied that prepared them for a role working with animals Great question. Um, so if any of you are animal lovers out there, I know that you probably all are. Um, and if you maybe want a career in this sort of job, there's a lot of different things you can do. So my personal story of kind of how I got to where I am, um, I started volunteering when I was really young at animal shelters and vet offices. Um, and that's some of my best advice. So animal shelters and vet offices, that's mostly cats and dogs, um, but it's still great experience. You know, you're learning about animals and how to care for them. Um, and like I've talked about all day today, you know, um, there's a lot of similarities in how you care for domestic animals versus wild animals. So that's a great place to start. Um, and even if you're young, sometimes you can volunteer at those places with a parent um, or adult. So that's a good place to start. Um, and then I studied really hard in high school, learned lots of science and moved on to college where I got a degree in zoology, um, which is like biology, but focused specifically on animals. Um, and then I worked in a zoo for a long time as a zookeeper um, and then moved into education here at the aquarium. Um, so I don't directly care for these animals and prepare their food and stuff like that, but I work with the people who do. Um, and now I get to do kind of the virtual programs like this where I'm talking to kids like you about these amazing animals. Animals. So um, I like all versions of it. There's a lot of different careers um, that have to do with caring for animals, whether it's, you know, science and research, maybe it's working in a zoo or an aquarium, um, or maybe it's veterinary care, you know, there's a really wide range, but I would say the best thing you can do is to keep learning. Like I suggested earlier, go to your library, check out books on the animals that interest you. Um, that's a great place to start. Um, and then volunteering with any place that will let you work with animals, maybe on a farm or a shelter or, um, or a of that office. Awesome. And then perhaps for our final question of the day, because it is getting to be about that time, we talked a lot about how humans use enrichment to better their lives and about how animals use enrichment to better their lives. Are there any cases where our students with pets at home can engage in enrichment activities that help both the humans and the animals involved together? Oh, great question, Haley. <laughs> um, definitely. Uh, so I like to think personally that I am enriched when I'm enriching my animals, right? So watching my dog figure out a puzzle or something, it's really entertaining for me. Um, and it's not something I do every single day. So that's a great way to do it. Um, but it, I mean, it totally depends on your animal, kind of what you're planning and what you're doing, but interacting with them, um, or even interacting with a brother or sister, you know, playing with people in your house, that's enrichment for you too. So um, even if you don't have a pet at home, trying something new, a new game, um, or a new art project, or reading a book together, 
um, you know, maybe think of something you haven't done in a while. If you're like, man, I haven't gotten out my colored pencils and drawn a picture in a while. Maybe I'm going to go get that out after this and do something different. Or I haven't read a book in a while. I'm going to go get a book and read. Um, or I'm going to run a lap around the house. You know, maybe you need that physical um, activity as your enrichment today, or maybe you need to stimulate your brain, you know, think about what maybe you need today um, or uh, tomorrow morning or whatever, you know, think up something different and try to enrich yourselves today. And I hope you guys were really enriched today by joining us for this star course um, because it's something different for me to do. I don't get to do these every single day too. So I definitely feel enriched as well. Wonderful. And uh, we definitely have lots of students who are very excited to maybe do a little more research to figure out the best possible enrichment activities for their pet cats and dogs and snakes and chickens and bearded dragons <laughs> and all sorts of different animals who uh, maybe have the opportunity to uh, guest listen in on today's lesson as well. So thank you once again to Susan and to the entire team at the South Carolina Aquarium. We do hope to see those selfies with Fritter and Picasso, so don't forget to tag us. And in the meantime, we hope to see you in another Varsity Tutor Star course soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.